Without any unfunny introductions, let's get started. The Roman Chickens If I told you to consult with the chicken before going for a job interview, you would laugh at me. You might also say that the only time I would love to see a chicken is at KFC. But in Roman times, chickens had more value than just filling a hungry person's belly. During most of the Roman Republic and Empire, the sacred chickens were consulted by politicians and leaders on the utmost important matters, for example, whether to go to war or not. Sacred chickens were raised by the Roman priests. Those priests would observe the behavior of the chickens toward the food. They would throw the seeds in front of the chickens. If they ate, it was battle. If they didn't, that would be considered a bad omen. But there was someone who had the guts to deny the authority of the sacred chicken. He was a commander, Publius Claudius Polker. During the First Punic War in 249 BC, Polker was in command of the Roman fleet and was preparing for the naval battle in war against the Carthage. So before engaging in battle, he consulted the sacred chickens to know what would be the outcome. During the ritual, chickens refused to eat anything. The outcome was decided by the sacred chickens. However, Polker said, If they will not eat, they will drink, and ordered to throw those chickens overboard into the sea. This was an indication that he didn't believe in it, or that he was quite sure that he would win. He proceeded with the battle, which didn't end well for him. In that disastrous battle, almost all his ships were lost, and thousands of Roman soldiers were either captured or killed. In another instance, sacred chickens ran into the woods before they were consulted for an upcoming campaign against Numantians. Those chickens were never found. Result? Decisive military defeat. So, my humble request to you is to remember the sacred chickens before eating chicken because they could give you signs for your important upcoming event. Xerxes the first versus the sea. Xerxes I was a Persian ruler who served as the fourth king of kings of the Achaemenid Empire. He was known for his massive invasion of Greece from across the Hellespont, a campaign marked by the battles of Thermopylae, Salamis, and Plataea. In 480 BC, he journeyed with his enormous army to the Hellespont Strait, which separated Asia from Europe. To get his army quickly into Greece, Xerxes ordered to build the bridge across the strait. To construct the bridge, they used many small boats tied to each other. But before his army could cross the bridge, a storm arose at sea and destroyed the bridge and a significant portion of his ships. Frustrated and furious, Xerxes ordered his soldiers to whip the sea three hundred times with the chains and stab it with red-hot iron, like that was going to do some critical damage to the sea. He also ordered to throw the handcuffs into the sea, symbolizing the sea's submission to his authority. This was fun until he ordered them to behead the engineers involved in the construction of the bridge. Eventually, they built the bridge and crossed the strait, but were defeated by the Greeks. So, the Persians retreated to the bridge, only to find the bridge destroyed by the sea again. Clearly, Xerxes Zero, C2. King Taijong fell off his horse. Taijong was the third king of the Joseon dynasty in the 15th century in Korea. During the whole Joseon dynasty, Professional historiographers kept records of all the events, from the daily lives of the kings to economic, religious, and diplomatic affairs. They called these records Sacho. They strictly wrote and maintained the records with total neutrality, which is difficult in today's scenario, as you all are aware of. Anyway, not even the king was allowed to see or alter the records. One day, King Taijong fell from his horse while hunting. He didn't want this event to be recorded, so he told everyone around him not to record it. Still, it was recorded. King Taijong tried to destroy those records, but those records were kept intact even after he attempted to destroy them. After five centuries, he is only famous as a king who fell from the horse and tried to hide the fact. I don't know what would have happened if someone shitted their pants, whether they wrote it as a historical record or kept the pants as records. Three popes at the same time. In 1378, Pope Gregory XI died. Under Pope Gregory, the papacy was brought back to Rome by ending the Avignon papacy, and hence the Romans rioted to ensure the election of a Roman pope after his death, so the cardinals gathered and elected Urban VI as pope. But soon, most of the cardinals who had elected Urban as pope regretted their decision, seeing his suspicious and violent temper personality. Then they disputed the validity of Urban's election, saying it was made under the fear of the Roman people, and elected their own candidate. Robert of Geneva, as anti-pope Clement VII. 
Clement VII established himself in Avignon, France. Now there were two popes at the same time. Because of this situation, the Catholic Church became divided along geographic and political lines. Italy and some parts of Europe supported Urban VI, while Antipope Clement VII had the backing of France and its allies. The situation remained the same till 1409, while the lines of each pope were maintained. In 1409, the cardinals of both groups decided to resolve the issue and arranged a meeting of both popes. But both Pope Benedict and Gregory XII backed at the last moment. Due to this, cardinals abounded their pope and arranged the Council of Pisa to dispose of both the Roman pope and the Avignon antipope as schismatical, heretical, perjured, and scandalous. Rather than solving the problem, they added to it by electing Peter Falagri, Cardinal Archbishop of Milan, as Alexander V. Obviously, the other two popes denied the cardinal's decision, and that's how they got their third pope. This image suits better for that situation. This schism was officially ended by the Council of Constance in 1417, when Pope Martin V was elected. Rabbit Attack In 1807, Napoleon's chief Alexander Berthier brought about 3,000 rabbits, only to be hunted. On the day of the hunt, those rabbits were released all at once. Rather than running away, all the rabbits came marching toward Napoleon and his men. Napoleon locked himself in a carriage until the area was cleared by the men. The rabbits defeated Napoleon. I think rabbits could recognize the men in power because another rabbit attack took place one and a half centuries later. But that was a solo attack. On April 20th, 1979, then-American President Jimmy Carter was enjoying his vacation in his hometown of Plains, Georgia. He was fishing in his rowboat in a pond on his farm. While fishing, he saw a swamp rabbit swimming towards him. Rabbit was marching his way towards him in a furious mood, hissing continuously and flashing his teeth. Realizing this enormous threat, Carter started hitting and splashing the water with the paddle. Due to this resilient reaction, Rabbit must have realized with whom he was dealing, so he retreated and changed his direction away from him. This is the photograph taken by the White House, which shows both in one frame. This photograph wasn't shared at that time, so cartoonists drew their own exaggerated interpretation of the event. This rabbit incident was also used to portray Carter negatively, like how someone who gets scared by rabbits is going to lead America and stop the Soviet Union. 1904 Summer Olympics Marathon 1904 St. Louis, America, was the first time the Olympic Games were organized outside Europe. Who would have thought it would be remembered as the most comic, scandalous, and chaotic Olympic event ever held? The major contributor to this infamous label was the men's marathon. 32 athletes from 12 different countries were qualified for the marathon. Only a few of them were experienced and recognized marathoners. Americas, A.L. Newton, Sam Meller, John Lorden, Thomas Hicks, and Michael Spring, all experienced marathoners, were among the favorites. There was another American runner named Fred Lors, who used to train at night because of his day job as a bricklayer. He entered the Olympics by placing in a special race sponsored by the Amateur Athletic Union. Among other athletes, there were ten Greeks who had never run a marathon, two tribal South African athletes who were standing on the line barefooted, there was one Cuban athlete named Felix Carbajal who raised money to come to the state by showcasing his running ability by running the length of the Cuban island, only to lose all the money on a dice game upon arrival at New Orleans. He somehow managed to reach St. Louis in his identical attire. On the 30th of August, in the 90-degree heat of St. Louis afternoon, precisely at 3.03, the marathon started with a gunshot. The 24-mile marathon path was covered by inches of dust, it had hilly areas with long ascents and rail traffic. Not only this, but athletes also had to tackle the people walking their dogs on the same road. They didn't have the protected even and restricted roads like today's marathon. Athletes were also provided only two water breaks 6 miles and 12 miles because the secretary of the Amateur Athletic Union, who evolved into the St. Louis Games organizer, wanted to see the result of purposeful dehydration. The race started with Thomas Hicks getting ahead within the first mile of the race. Californian athlete William Garcia could have been the first casualty of the Olympic marathon due to the plumes of dust swirled by the official's motors. He collapsed on the side of the road, and then he was immediately hospitalized. 
his guts and esophagus were affected by the dust. In another place, Wild Dog chased one of the South Africans a mile off course, which I believe could have been another purposeful animal attack by the St. Louis game organizer to study the performance under fear. Anyway, our gambling mailman and pro dice player Carvajal was having a good time by snatching the peaches from the people, stopping a bit to chat with the people in his broken English. But after suffering from stomach cramps, he laid down and took a nap. At the nine-mile mark, Bricklayer Lors, the night owl, also suffered cramps, so he hitched a car ride, waving to the spectators and to the rivals like a politician. This was a literal mockery of the Olympic Games. In all this chaos, Thomas Hicks, who was an American favorite, came under two-man support at the 10-mile mark. Hicks managed to keep himself alive in the race, even though the two supporters weren't providing anything he demanded. At the 18-mile mark, they fed him strychnine, the first recorded instance of drug use in modern Olympic sports, and egg white. Meanwhile, Bricklayer Lors emerged from the 11-mile ride in his automobile, ignoring Hicks' handler's shouts towards him. Lors climbed down the vehicle just five miles before the finish, and then completed the race, obviously in first place. An American won, people chanted in joy. Alice Roosevelt, daughter of then-American President Theodore Roosevelt, was about to lower the gold medal over Lors, but someone from the crowd claimed Lors had not run the entire race. Realizing that his foul play had been recognized, Lors's face was like, ha ha, I was joking, I never wanted the medal. While Hicks somehow managed to breathe and kept his legs going with the help of two handlers who gave him the same cocktail as before, but with some brandy. At last, his trainers carried him over the line aloft, while his legs were still going back and forth. He was awarded the gold medal and was the official winner of that strange, challenging, and comic marathon. That's it for today. Like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. See you later. I mean, in the next video. Bye.